So I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker, and we also have someone who's going to help moderate. Um, so Leah Weiss is going to be our next speaker, and she's a PhD, MSW, a researcher, lecturer, consultant, and author. And she actually teaches the compassionate leadership at, at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, um, where she created this course that's been incredibly popular called Leading with Mindfulness and Compassion. And she's also a principal teacher and founding faculty member of Stanford's Compassion Cultivation Program, which was conceived by the Dalai Lama. So exciting to have her here. Um, and then the amazing Sherry Lasilla will be helping to introduce Leah a little bit more and facilitate that discussion. Sherry is like an, a guru when it comes to executive coaching and facilitating, you know, women's circles and leadership circles. So for the past 20 years, she's run leadership programs for organizations, including the Stanford Graduate School of Business, Wisdom 2.0, and the Shift Network. Uh, and so I'm just so excited to have both of them here. Um, and as, as some of you know, my, my mom is really not doing well. She has pancreatic cancer. And so I'm going to be stepping off um, to spend some time with my mom. Uh, and Sherry and Leah are going to be uh, having this next discussion. So Leah is going to be teaching and presenting and Sherry will be kind of moderating and looking at your questions and comments and, and raising them for Leah. So I just want to introduce you both at the same time and hand it off. So you should be uh, unmuted and available to chat. So welcome, Sherry and Leah. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And thank you, Carol. That was awesome. So, and thank you so much, Vanessa, for doing this. And I'm happy to step in so you can go and spend some precious time with your mom. Um, you're so welcome. So hi everyone. I'm so thrilled for you to have an opportunity to be with Leah today. So Vanessa already told you about Leah. I won't add too much other than I will share that I recently started collaborating with Leah um, on her company Skylight, which she co-founded just about a year or two ago, which uses the latest in neuroscience and behavior change to empower high-performing leaders and managers to prevent burnout for themselves and their teams. And so one of the things that I love about Leah, as I've been getting to know her through this collaboration, is that she is someone who really walks her talk um, and she is incredibly dedicated and I think you'll see right away that she is somebody who deeply cares about what she's presenting. She deeply cares about her students. She deeply cares um, about the, the, the people that she can make a difference for. And so uh, thank you, Leah, for stepping in and being here today and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Sherry. It's great to be with you all. Um, yeah, it's good to be together in a time like this. Um, I wanted to start by um, sharing the first two pages. They're short pages. It's a small book from um, a, a, my second book that just came out recently about resilience um, in unexpected situations uh, to frame our discussion today. Um, so the book starts, for most of us, life is built around routines. We go about our daily business repeating the same patterns, generally speaking, whether it's our commute to and from work, our adherence to bedtime schedule that ensures we and our children develop good sleeping habits, in parentheses, hopefully, it's very much hopeful at this moment in my house, or the way we unwind with our friends and partners at the weekend. We don't expect things to change dramatically. We know the sun will come up in the morning and go down at night but we generally trundle along in a kind of sleepwalking state. We know enough about neuroscience to understand why we do this. Our brains have created shortcuts that allow us to navigate our daily activities with as little effort as possible. We do things without thinking, ignoring details about the environment and specifics about our internal experiences to conserve energy. And skipping ahead, this technique, while efficient, can cause us to miss key moments to stop, take stock, and notice. But what happens when life presents an unexpected challenge? Sometimes it's a small thing, sometimes much larger. When we encounter major shakeups for which there is no quick fix, when such events hit us with full force, will we have the tools we need not only to survive, but to do so with calmness, dignity, and even grace. Is there also a way of coping that ensures that we won't suffer from subsequent psychological trauma? 
there are two critical questions. What skills do we need to face such challenges and how can we develop these skills in a realistic way? So I wanna start us off from that framework of we are in a massive disruption. We are in a moment where our routines and what we rely on are not gonna support us in the same ways. That is both a challenge and an opportunity. I'm not one to try to talk in cliches, but what I do wanna explore with all of you um, oh my, um, is what it would look like. Is the sound better now, Vanessa? Just seeing that there's a, a glitch with the sound. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's okay. getting a little bit. Um, Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Not sure why. So much Wi-Fi use in my neighborhood, I think, might be part of it, although I am on the south. Um, so the standard, this, what I want us to explore today is how we can use tools, resources, and reframe what we're going through so that we can be more resilient, not just for ourselves, but for our families, our organizations, our communities, because people are relying on us now. Um, a brief snippet about my, how I came to the study of resilience and more specifically the topic of compassion um, that I wanna double click on and be with you all in today. Um, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, um, I had a few things happen in my personal life in, in a very um, short time frame. Um, my father was diagnosed with the illness that eventually took his life, and my best friend that I'd grown up with, who also went to Stanford, um, his life ended um, um, from mental illness and um, as a result of suicide. And it was a terrible moment for me. And I had no ability to stay in focus in my classes. I had a mentor at that time who um, had been um, very involved with the Tibetan refugee community. I had been studying history and Buddhist studies with him. And he helped me get one of these undergrad research grants and get myself over to Northern India, where I ended up spending, uh, about a year and a half um, studying the topic of resilience in the context of um, Tibetan refugee education. And so the question that I was exploring to write my honors thesis, but really exploring in my heart and my life, was what is it that's happening here in the context of um, Tibetan culture, Tibetan Buddhism, that I can learn from so that I can like make it through this um, you know, disruption, let's say, in my own life. And what quickly became clear to me and, you know, spending time up at the Tibetan Children's Village, which is basically a giant school slash orphanage um, that sits above the town on the mountain um, and talking to teachers and educators from talking to the Dalai Lama, who was much more accessible in that moment. If you were there, you could go and have audiences with him, which I, I was grateful to take advantage of. And what everybody came back to over and over again um, was the importance of compassion as a source of resilience. But not just thinking of that as like, okay, we should be compassion, work done, compassionate, work done, but compassion is a cultivation. Compassion is something we train in. Um, and so, of course, being there, the main thing to do um, was to go to Buddhist teachings, to spend time um, in um, uh, seeing teachings from the Dalai Lama and other geshes and spending time at monasteries there um, to learn what the traditional practices around compassion were. So long story short, when I came back um, and eventually uh, begrudgingly finished my undergraduate education um, and then went got further fellowships to go spend more time, kind of went back and forth um, for about 10 years between getting a couple of graduate degrees and doing three to six months silent meditation retreats to try to learn these practices of compassion and wisdom from the Tibetan tradition. And when I was in school, my main question was, what is the science behind these? And how can we think about the educating, taking pedagogy, translating these into resources for people without presuming the need to learn all the context of Tibetan Buddhism, which is beautiful, but a lot, right? Like any wisdom tradition, there's a whole worldview and a whole set of um, 
of work that needs to be done. And so my research question and life question became, how do we teach this and train this? And so when I was in grad school, I, I collaborated with some of my mentors to do this. When I was finishing my dissertation, um, I, I finally got on the phone, the Dalai Lama's interpreter, Chieftain Jimpa, who at that point had been starting a program at Stanford, at the Compassion Center at Stanford. And he was um, basically exactly doing what I had wanted, most wanted to do. So I was interviewing him. How are you thinking about the adaptations? How are you sure they're going to work? Where are you testing them? What are you doing in terms of like the research psychology part, but also the commitment to transformation that you don't lose the Buddha with the bathwater, you know, to use the metaphor. Um, so long story short, um, what ended up happening for me was joining this compassion center. And soon after I was at Stanford, I started connecting with a bunch of students, including MBA students who were, who were um, really advocating for the need for this to come into MBA education. So I pitched, um, you know, one of the kind of sub deans at the time. And uh, the first response was like, ah, you know, I see the value, but French is also really important, but French is something that we can teach across the street. We don't need to have it in the business school. So I was like, okay, you know, kept having conversations, going to other people in the leadership till I found someone who saw the importance of the topic um, and, and got started in it. Um, in the first year, I collaborating with Kelly McGonigal, who's a remarkable educator and researcher. Um, so long story short, like, the point I want to make is that we are in this strange time where there's a massive amount of, of research, really compelling research about the health science of compassion, the benefits for our biology when we train in compassion, the fundamental research that we can get better at compassion, that we're not just relegated to our set point of emotional intelligence and capacity for compassion, but it's something we can improve in with effort, um, with training. And then more interestingly, when I started exploring this class was from an organizational psychology point of view, there's actually been decades of research about compassionate or in, compassion in organizations, compassionate leadership. What are the tools and resources that um, make a leader or a team or an organization more compassionate? So that's the stuff that I kind of um, bundled together into the course that I've been teaching for, it was like eight years, um, and, you know, starting to bring this into a lot of other contexts, including organizations like in the work I'm doing with um, Sherry more recently. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the backstory and also, um, you know, I think maybe really briefly to talk about high level some of this research. We could spend hours, we could spend this whole hour, but I won't on research, but just to give you a sense of the kind of work people in the field are doing. Um, so from the perspective of, of biological markers on, um, first of all, to define compassion. So I, I love that that question is coming up in the chat bar. There's multiple definitions of compassion. The one we use at the Compassion Center and the one I use in my work after much thought and discussion is the um, recognition of suffering with a willingness to engage that suffering. So recognizing suffering in others and being willing to engage it. Um, so if you look at that definition built into it, what you see, um, you can't recognize suffering in other people or in yourself if you're distracted or rushing around by internal noise, by technology. There is a fundamental first step we have to take to train ourselves to be attentive in, to what's happening. Then there's a second step that we have to make the appraisal that the other person or ourself needs and deserves the compassion. So this is where a lot of compassion research overlaps with in-group, out-group research, um, looking at how we are disinclined to give that appraisal that the person needs and deserves it. We are less likely if we judge them to be not in our in-group, but we can train ourselves to expand what we mean by our in-group. Um, and then the last part that we need for compassion is we need to make the appraisal that we ourselves have the resources needed. And so that doesn't, that could be money, that could be time, that could be energy. 
right? And so you can think of a scenario like if I'm on the way out of the office back when I would go places, um, and someone wants to talk to me at the end of the day, but I've got a kid in daycare, and I know if I don't get there at whatever hour, it starts, you know, costing $15 a second um, to for every additional moment that they're there. The, I might see the person suffering. I might actually really want to engage, see them as worthy of response, but I don't have the resource at that time, right? So there's all different places in this, um, in these cycles of compassion where we could see the person suffering but blame them because they were the cause of their own suffering so no compassion happens or we see their suffering we we want to help but we view ourselves as lacking resources um so compassion training engages each of these steps and helps us break down where the blocks are so that we can overcome them um but you know very briefly from like uh the health health science point of view, when we develop compassion, I think one of the most important things that happens is this helps us to then tune into the soothing system. Um, so we can get stuck in threat or drive modes where we are chronic stress and fear about what's happening in our environment or constant drive where we're trying to attain and get and accomplish. Compassion helps us tune in, tap our, ourselves back into that third self-soothing system that we need so we can rest, so we can digest. Um, and you see that we are really bad at that in, in this era um, where sleep aids and GI problems are so massive. We can't rest and we can't digest. We need to relearn these fundamental skills that we need to be healthy and to be a person um, that's effective. So more specifically, you know, there's so much interesting work out of UCSF looking at telomeres, the protective caps of ends of the chromosomes um, that they lengthen, which is associated um, with usefulness when they shorten. It's associated with aging. There's fMRI studies about what, how our brains change when we practice training and compassion over time. Um, there's vagal tone studies out of the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley, where the vagus nerve, um, which helps, um, which runs, it's a, it runs through the heart, through the digestive system, and it helps us um, connect with our environment and other people. There's so much to say, but um, I think rather than spend the whole time talking about compassion, what might be more useful um, is to share some exercises. Um, but I did want to start up in the kind of prep call with Vanessa, the idea of, of giving some context first. Um, so let's try a meditation. Um, and if you're up for it, I'll make it a brief one that we can do together to give you a sense of what this is like. Um, if you were to take up a compassion meditation practice. So we'll go ahead and start and take maybe, maybe give a little bit of context in terms of compassionate leadership at this particular sure. time. So we're now going to go into yeah. some of the developing compassion, but maybe just a few sentences around what are some of the things sure. that leaders in terms of bringing compassion into our organizations at this time that's going to make the biggest difference. And maybe sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I had been thinking to do that after the meditation, but I can do it before. Um, so I think some of the critical pieces, I was there with um, part of Carol's session, and I do, I agree completely that how we show up is critical at this time. Um, being aware of when our own emotional dysregulation, when we are freaked out by other people's feelings and how to work through that, when we are um concerned about our own ability to navigate um, in, um, a lot of emotion, either internally or externally. A compassionate leader is someone who is leading with e EQ, with emotional quotient, um, and is demonstrating to their team that you are there, that you recognize as the famous um, Peter Frost, who was a, a, a compassion researcher who really started this field of study in OB. He's, he's, his quote was, there is always pain in the room. That is true now more than ever. So starting in every interaction with other people, not skipping over the fact that there's pain in the room, acknowledging it, um, seeing what's needed. And that's going to be different for different teams, different functions. Um, 
but if people want to be heard or maybe sometimes people want to go on um, and really focus on their work as a break um, from what else is happening as a break from the news cycle and the homeschooling. Cheryl Sandberg gave a talk at Stanford um, last year and was talking about in the period after losing her husband that actually for her, it was a relief to throw herself into her work as a break from the grief and the questions and whatnot. Um, I think one of the important things in that statement is that people, just as much as one person might react that way, there could be people other people who don't want to work or who want to talk about it, who want to be seen by their coworkers. So understanding and being a compassionate leader that what you're feeling and what you need is not this interchangeable with each person on your team and really getting to the discussion of how can each person get best supported within the art of the possible right now. That I would say is critical for compassionate leadership. But the only way to do that is if you are resourcing yourself to be able to sustain being that resource for other people, because you will run out quite quickly in a time like this, right? Where there's no one here who isn't undergoing change and stress and fear and tolerating ambiguity. So that's what we need to be able to do to understand, like, we need to recharge our own battery so that we can continue to lead and charge others um, and we also, you know, need to experiment with, with being an incomplete, imperfect leader and what that looks like to show up that way. Um, so, hence why this kind of a meditation could be very helpful. Um, the other exercise that I was thinking we could do together is actually take a minute or two to do the um, a quiz about our coping styles and risk for burnout, because this is a high risk moment for each of us and work off of that um, as another exercise. It's a non-meditative approach to developing more compassion for ourselves and others. So are people game to try a short meditation and get a sense what this is like? Okay, thanks yeah. for um, inviting more context, Sherry. That's the, the interesting thing about like, you know, we've been talking about remote meetings and whatnot, um, but giving a talk remotely is so, uh, <laughs> you can't read the room in the same way and engage. Um, so I really do appreciate comments in the chat bar and questions and you um, bringing what you want and need to it, because this is for you um, and for all of us to be together. So, okay, I'm gonna do a very brief version of a compassion meditation. We'll start by just getting yourself comfortable. If you're brand new to meditation, this is a fine starting place. If you're a long time experienced meditator, um, then join in and help support the group. We're gonna take a couple of deep cleansing breaths. This actually comes out of Tibetan yoga, where you breathe in, fill the chest, fill the abdomen with air, hold it for a few moments, and then a really full exhalation. And repeat that process two more times with a full inhale, holding for a few moments, which, help, which helps settle the mind, and then a full exhale. And the exhale is actually audible, but you're muted, so no one knows that you're being a mouth breather. And repeat that one more time. And let's just take one minute here to rest our attention on the breath, knowing that even within the course of one minute, our minds are gonna move off many times over. And each time your mind moves to a thought or a chain of thought, as soon as you notice it has, just bring your attention back to the breath. We'll do this for just one minute to help settle our minds.
And now I want to invite you to bring to mind someone that you feel connection with, someone you're close to, a loved one, or a close friend. And notice how you feel when you think of them. It could be a child, a relative, a friend. And considering that this person is going through a difficult experience right now, as we all are, notice the automatic, spontaneous concern that you feel for them. The automatic urge to reach out and help and support. And you can use phrases that you can mentally recite as part of a visualization for them. May you know your resilience. May you know your strength. May you find wellness or peace. May you know your resilience. May you know your strength. May you find wellness and peace. And adding into this practice, thinking of another person, now thinking of a stranger somewhere in your neighborhood, perhaps, that you don't know well, recognizing that this person also is struggling also is in the midst of ambiguity, is anxious and afraid for themselves, for their loved ones, and extending compassion to this person. May you know your resilience. May you know your strength. And we can start to expand on this by considering more people in your neighborhood who are all in their home or without homes having a similar experience. Trying to be strong to support one another the best they can imperfectly. and extending compassion to each of these people, broadening to include more and more geographically in your region, in your state, in your country, and further and further. Considering how the various things we rely on in our lives, our food, our health, everything that we're using, our computers, our books, the ideas that inspire us, all rely on countless other people. that we're connected to them in our daily existence, whether we think about it or not. And expanding compassion here to all of these people all over the place that are experiencing what you and your loved ones are feeling. May they find their resilience. May they know their strengths. And to the last step of this meditation, you can drop a visualization 
and just notice whatever you're feeling in this moment. Physically, emotionally, what's happening in you. Bringing mindfulness to your own experience on the heels of extending compassion. And I'll share a traditional Tibetan dedication that's been said for thousands of years um, at the end of meditation practice to conclude this meditation. May the pure, brilliant sun of awakening dawn in each and every heart and mind unstoppably until all are fully illumined and awakened. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes and we can transition from the meditation, but maintaining this thread of mindfulness and this, if you've experienced any sense of increased connection, care um, in the context of that meditation, carrying that forward with you. So that's, an example of um, what a compassion training um, meditation looks like. It's one way of developing more compassion. You know, for years when I've been teaching this at GSB, um, I always approach it as part of the exploration and what it means to be a compassionate leader. I think meditation is a profound resource. It's something we know is the best way to develop a skill like compassion or mindfulness, but it's also not everybody's jam. Um, and, and even if it is something that we profoundly connect to, we still have to ask and answer, okay, and what does this look like in work, in mom life, in partner life, in the, the rest of life? Um, and I think that that's a big part of what gets really interesting in a moment. Like now, you know, thinking through questions like, how how might compassion look in the context of the teams I'm working on? Um, what are the boundary conditions um, that I'm experiencing, right? Like maybe it feels like there's not enough resources to give all the support that's needed to the people who need fill in the blank time, um, who need jobs, right? There's not a lot of, of cutbacks going on and difficult choices to be made. And I think really what gets interesting are the questions around how do you do this from a compassionate leadership point of view? Um, you know, I remember Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn, came into my class last year and we had a really interesting conversation because, um, you know, LinkedIn, and he talked a lot about compassion as a corporate value, but one of the things I love about teaching at GSB is my students pull no punches. So they were like, okay, and, you know, what about, you know, how you treat people in middle management? What does that look like from a compassionate point of view? Can you fire someone um, compassionately? If so, what might that look like? And how do you know it's not a rationalization? Um, these kinds of questions to me are the heart of what's important about compassionate leadership. Um, I do a lot of work with YPO, the Young Presidents Organization, and chapters all over the place. And when I'm together with groups of CEOs, these are the kinds of conversations we have about what are the boundary conditions you're defining in your mental model for where you can and can't be compassionate. Are they true? What would it mean to find um, a way to put more of a priority on compassion if you change um, your assumptions, if you change, um, you know, how you're adding up um, the impact on the bottom line. So, like, a classic example in compassionate leadership is, um, you know, how do you approach it when someone on the team is going through a really difficult time? You know, one point of view says that you need to um, – you can't do anything for an individual that you can't scale to everybody in that role in the organization, like a legalistic point of view that if I do this for Sherry, who might be trying to support a sick relative, what's going to happen when everybody else in the organization and inevitably has a sick relative, we can't afford to give all of them the money, the time, the things. So we don't do it for Sherry. 
right? Or or relying on this vantage point of people need to keep a professional um, orientation at work and the rest of their life kind of managed outside if they want to be seen as serious um, and someone who um, can hang and who can hack it in whatever this field is. Um, and I think, interestingly, if you look at the research on compassionate leadership, the costs aren't obvious. So in that model, yes, it's logical to say, if you can't scale it to everyone, it doesn't make sense to do it. So you have to set a precedent that you can scale. But what that doesn't account for is, let's say in this example with Sherry, that you know she's been at the organization, she's in a leadership role, she's been working her butt off for years, she's seen um, in, um, of having put blood, sweat, and tears into her work. She cares a lot. And so when she doesn't get that support when she needs it, for her, not only does obviously her engagement go down, her, she's hurt, she's less loyal to the company, she may not dust off her LinkedIn uh, resume and move in the course of this crisis, but she will, her retention will go down, and that all bears out in the research. But the real cost to the company is the exponential cost that everybody around Sherry who's been looking to her and seeing her as an example of a committed employee, um, as a committed contributor or leader, she got thrown under the bus. So we can be quite clear on what's gonna happen to us when our moment comes, right? So you see in these studies that it's the whole wider area around Sherry that have the engagement go down, the absenteeism go up, the retention go down, um, the, cost, the loyalty go down. And I think this is the kind of, you know, when I made the point, we have to redefine um, how we're analyzing what's possible and not possible, because we might be making a short-term calculus on a situation that's going to actually, the long tail cost of not being a humanized leader. Um, and there's so many more examples, like, you know, back to that question of what if you're in a position where you're going to have to make choices now about who you're going to not be able to employ going forward. Lots of us are going to have to make that choice in the in the weeks and months to come. Um, you know, I thought actually this was one of the places I was most impressed, and I think uh, from what Jeff Weiner was talking about in my class that day, he made the point that nobody should outsource um, the painful conversation. If someone has been reporting to you, if they've been on your team, being a compassionate leader and showing up is not outsourcing the firing conversation to another party, right? To show up and have that difficult conversation and deal with it yourself and resource yourself to have it, um, to have communication with your team. There's a lot of like um, outdated ideas about what's possible and not possible in terms of communicating when someone's leaving a team. Like there's ideas out there prevalently that, oh, we can't say anything or it's a legal liability. There's so many companies now who are doing a much better job of communicating and humanizing the offboarding process. And that's critical because if you don't, if someone just evaporates from the team with no explanation, no dignity in that, um, and, and also not being asked themselves about how they want that communication to happen, that they're, it's all happening to them. Um, that actually creates follow-on trauma and fear and likelihood um, for distress and burnout for the people who are left because they're waiting for when the next round of people evaporating is gonna show up. So it's really important in these times of like when it's the hardest, um, we have to resource ourselves. If that's through meditation, fine. If that's not cool, but find whatever your way is that you are training yourself to have, um, you know, as Gandhi put it, that compassion is a muscle that gets stronger with youth. So what are we doing to strengthen our muscle in a time that we really need it? Um, so, you know, I'm super curious to hear um, what's on your mind, so feel free to write in the chat bar if you have questions. An exercise that I thought we might do, I have, um, through Skylight, we've created a, um, a self-assessment that helps us understand our risk of burnout um, based on our personality type and coping strategy. And it's pretty quick, and since you all have computers, I thought we could take a moment and do that quiz. Um, I just put the link in the chat bar. 
So what you could do is click on it um, and go over and take the questionnaire and it'll give you a result that tells you what your risk profile is for burning out. Um, and I think this could be a really interesting place to take the last, you know, 15 minutes that we have together about how do we resource ourselves knowing our personality and um, in risks so that we can be there for ourselves, for our family, for our team. Um, so I'll give you a minute to go ahead and take that. And when you get your results, um, if you want to put it in the chat bar, that would be helpful. Um, and then it'll also give me a sense of when you're done. Now, these are great questions that I'll come to when people are back from taking the quiz, too. Thanks for putting them in the chat bar. So here is the link. I'll put it at the bottom again. Are you seeing it in the chat bar? Oops, that's my email. Let me put, I was going to share that out, and I just did. Um, here we go. We post the link here in the chat box. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, this is really beautiful. I'm, I, I know we're, I'm meant to be quiet to let people do the self-assessment, but I'm also <laughs> got some of the comments and questions because there's some really beautiful comments and questions coming in. So please uh, continue yeah. to post your comments and questions and we'll, we will have a chance to read them out. And when you're done with the quiz, you could either put what your type was or if it hit home um, or any reaction you want in the chat bar as well. And then I'll circle back to some of these questions and we can debrief about how to use uh, the self-awareness and our profile in our work. I'll give it one more minute in case everyone's off actually having an early lunch. You never know. <laughs> okay, they're start, starting to come in in the chat. People are starting to. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, okay, I'll give it another 30 seconds for folks to finish up. And, um, and you don't have to post what your answer is, but if you want to, that's great. Um, so, okay, let's talk a little bit more about this quiz. Um, so the way that we set it up was to use individual coping styles. So thinking of yourself as a battery, how do you get energy and how do you get rid of negative energy? So personality types in terms of what motivates us, the motivational theory, are we motivated by people, by a cause? Um, by getting shit done, by accomplishing stuff on one axis, and then the other axis um, is looking at how we get rid of negative energy. Do we internalize it? Do we blame others? Do we avoid it? So we have a lot of reinvestors here. Um, and so that profile would, um, would mean that 
under, so how do you use that profile? So understanding that you're likely to rid yourself of negative energy by continuing to throw yourself back in your work, right? So that has a risk with it of workaholism. There's other risks with each of the personality profiles, right? So um, if we are someone who is going to protect others or externalize, that has a different set of risks that we want to be careful about right now, because there's a lot, no matter what our coping strategy is, it isn't good or bad, but knowing how we work is critical for um, ourselves. Yes, so I can put up, um, um, Sorry, it's hard to, so Admiral and, and someone's still working on it. I can share out a description of all the profiles on the website and we're done so you can look at the graph and everything. Um, I'll, I'll send that over to Vanessa to post. But I think the key to take away is whatever your propensity is, if it's avoidance, if it's, self, if it's um, uh, to distract and detach, or if it's to double down on your work, um, what you want to do is be aware of that in a time of high stress, right? So that you can manage yourself, but also communicate with the people around you to let them know like, hey, be on the lookout for this, whether it's your family, your teammates, and structuring a conversation with others around what your, what your personality types are. If the whole team is reinvestors, then you want to, um, you know, make sure that you're all going to share the same bias. So who's going to, what are you going to put in place so that you make sure everybody's not working around the clock as a way to manage their own stress and burning themselves out in short order, right? So making some commitments as a team to pulling back from that strategy of reinvesting. And maybe there's other places to put that energy um, that will help create more sustaining um, uh, for, the, for the period to come. Um, so I'll post, I'll, I'll give you some more resources on the website afterwards. I want to move back to some of these great questions and comments in the chat bar um, before we close out our time. Um, and I love this comment about changing fields to stay in integrity with oneself. I think that that is, um, you know, a great example to us of, of, of what it means to be clear on the fact that we don't have to stay with something that we've been doing just because we've been doing it and having the courage to change is sometimes the best path for our, um, what we're doing with our career. Um, where This next question about thanks for sharing um, and meditation, where do you put giving advice while being compassionate? That is a great question. So in my course, we spend actually a lot of time on practicing, like really unpacking that. Um, to put yourself in situations where you're practicing communicating in different ways. So one example would be, um, you know, say Sherry and I are in a conversation and she's going through a difficult time, practicing listening from the point of view of not what can I add or what can I tell, but putting myself in her shoes as best I can. Um, so really building the skill of empathic listening. Um, working on, um, Carol mentioned this, and I write about this in my book, How We Work, Interpersonal Mindfulness. So being aware of when our need for to give advice is about managing our discomfort with someone's discomfort, um, which often it is, and versus when um, advice is rarely the best strategy, as far as I can tell, unless someone's actively asking for it. That's what I'm told by people who are really like great leaders and coaches. So if we think we have clarity on what someone else should be doing, our best strategy is still going to be to ask questions of them. And, and I think, you know, share a hypothesis or share a story, but straight out advice, especially if there's a power differential in a team, if someone's reporting to you and you're trying to tell them what to do, um, it's not going to be the effective compassionate leadership example. Sharing of your own experience, asking questions, sharing what you're feeling in response to their what they're feeling, asking, you know, trying to sort out that way, I think can be a better strategy. And, you know, I'm saying this, and do I fall into giving advice? Just ask my partner, I do. So, you know, that's part of self-compassion, right? That we will have habits of communication that we work with and trying out a different one. Um, I really recommend the exercise of listening 
from the perspective of adding value by being with the person rather than giving them content as an experiment is such a profound tool. I have done this with people from MBA students and CEOs to like veterans with post-traumatic stress I've worked with. And I think for all of us, this we believe we're helping the other person by doing something, but so often our best way of helping is to be present with our emotions, with their emotions, and ask the real question that's of service to them if there is one. Um, I love this other question about in order to keep my own oxygen mask on, I realized last week I can't ignore the daily loss of life that's occurring. I've begun daily meditation to pray, pray for the people that are passing, um, that they know they are loved and that this knowing creates peace for them as they pass. This meditation allows me to not ignore that vast pain that is occurring and to help myself center my energy. That is beautiful. That is a great example of why meditation is a really important resource to not suppress emotions. Suppressing emotions is like the number one bad strategy that is really often used by high functioning people and low functioning people by people, right? It's like we think that if we're having big feelings, if we distract or suppress, that's going to be helpful. But if you look at all the research, um, if you look at the wisdom tradition, suppression is not the way to go. So things like prayer and meditation or just bringing awareness to what we're feeling by having a conversation with someone who can hear us um, is a much healthier and more sustainable strategy for ourselves in the long run and will bring us um, much more resilience and we'll bring it to the people around us. So I think that's a great example. Um, love hearing that. Um, Leah, there's hmm. a question about the quiz. Somebody's saying that sometimes the answers are not clearly one or the other. Yeah. So I know I had that experience yeah. with uh, the quiz. In fact, I took it to yeah. two different answers. So maybe you could speak uh, to that as Absolutely. Well. Yeah, and I think, so this quiz, we developed it as basically a conversation starter with oneself, right, about what am, how am I coping, what are my strategies, what are my defaults. It's not meant to be the rigorous, like, assessment that is the key and all determinant for who we are. It's, it's really meant as, like, an icebreaker with ourselves, or better yet, an icebreaker with your team so you can talk about coping styles in stressful times as a way to help start the conversation for like building psychological safety. What do you need? How can I help you? We're all in a time where there's a lot of negative um, in ambiguity to deal with. So what are the habits I have? How can I move into more healthy ones? That's really what it's getting at. And it, it can be interesting to see whether the act, there's two axes. There's the one of like your motivation style um, and you know, what, if you're motivated by cause or other people or accomplishment, and then there's, are you, do you internalize, externalize, or avoid the negative? Um, so I'd be curious for the questions you could answer either way. Are they about um, your motivation or are they about your coping? And, and it makes sense that we sometimes have multiple coping strategies. We could, you know, be a combination of self-criticism or internalizing and avoiding and go back and forth between those strategies. So, um, but being aware that we have both of those strategies would be useful so we can watch for both of them, communicate both of them to the people we're closest with, um, who we need to rely on and who are relying on us. Um, I particularly so, yeah. thinking a little bit about kind of what's your motivation style at this point or what is it? So I think one of the things that's most important during times of challenge or times of crisis is how do we find deep meaning um, in, in some of these moments, right? And I know you've also done a lot in your work around purpose. So I think this reflection on what is it that brings me meaning? What is it that brings me purpose? Is it from a cause? Is it from people? Um, and then really using that information so that we can amplify those things in our lives right now that are bringing that source of meaning and purpose and joy and connection. So I just wanted to underline that, that piece of that for you. Great point. Yeah, spoken like a veteran coach too, right? Helping us sort through when we're trying to 
navigate competing impulses for how to respond or which direction to go in. And then I'll just read out a comment from Darlene. She's also saying, I enjoy heart-centered meditation, bringing the world into a field of non-judgment, no comparisons, nothing to figure out, compassion, unconditional love, healing, and presence. Um, and so thank you. I think, uh, I think kind of sharing these heart-centered meditations and other practices with each other. So feel free to continue to post some of those in the, in the chat box. Um, if you've got them, it's great to share these resources. Well, thank you all. It's been really great to connect with you and wishing you all the best. And I'll get over those resources that we chatted about to Vanessa so she can put them up on her site. Um, and enjoy the next um, half hour you have to continue to process and um, integrate what you've been doing this morning. Yes, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate what you shared. Um, con we'll continue to practice which is one that I particularly love. So thank you again. And I see that thank Vanessa you. is back. Yes. So thank uh, you, Leo. That was wonderful. Thank you. Your email address and the quiz and Sherry shared the name of your book. So we'll also post all of that with the recording so that people can access everything in one place. So thank you for thank your wisdom you. and guidance. So appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been great to spend time with you all. Take care. Much love. Bye. Mm -hmm.